Welcome. Good evening to the United States Geological Survey. And I have to first applaud all of you because you saw the lights dim and you all hushed. <laughs> and I hadn't even gotten up here. It's on. Maybe I'm not close enough. Thank you. And thank you for feedback. So that's great. Um, <laughs> so I'm Diane Garcia, and I work for our Science Information Services Office, and I'm so glad to see you here. Um, before we introduce this evening's speaker, I want to go ahead and let you know there will not be a December public lecture, but stay tuned. We will be back in um, 2018 with a January lecture. It's going to be by um, Doug Given with our Earthquake Science Center, and he's going to talk about Shake Alert, the path to the West Coast Earthquake Early Warning, how a few seconds can save lives and property. So I hope to see you all here on January 2-5, um, 2018 for that. Yeah, I want to make sure I give the right date. Um, but what we're really here for tonight is a lecture, Sea Otters, Confessions of a Keystone Carnivore. And it's going to be presented by Dr. Tim Tinker. Tim is a research wildlife biologist with the Western Ecological Research Center for USGS and an adjunct professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Since 1993, he's been studying sea otter populations and their roles as top predators in California, Alaska, British Columbia, and the Russian Commander Islands. Dr. Tinker is a project leader for federal research on sea otters in California and heads a multi-agency study investigating the factors limiting the recovery of this threatened subsea species. Tim's research also focuses on the ecology of coastal marine communities, particularly the suite of direct and indirect interactions between sea otters and other species in the nearshore environment. And he uses this as a model system to elucidate the influence of high trophic level consumers on organization of the communities within which they live. Tim utilizes quantitative modeling approaches to integrate diverse data sets, exploring how individual level processes like physiology behavior translate into population level dynamics like recovery, decline, and redistribution and they can affect um, food, web structure, and ecosystem health. So the USGS's monthly public lecture series is pleased to bring you a program this evening about sea otters and the ecosystem with which they live. Let's give Tim a big round of applause. Thank you. Well done. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, and, and the round of applause even before I've said anything, that's remarkable. Um, thank you all for coming out here to, uh, to hear tonight the, uh, the confessions of our friends, the sea otters. Um, before, uh, before I begin, how many of you here have, um, have seen sea otters before? Okay, so, so I'm talking to a knowledgeable audience about sea otters. How many people here like sea otters? Wow, okay, that's, that's good to know even before we begin. All right, how many here, people here have been bitten by a sea otter before? Fewer, that explains why you all like sea otters. Uh, I have been bitten by sea otters, and I still like sea otters, um, although I just have a healthy respect for them, and we try and avoid the sharp end, as we say. Um, so you may wonder, why would I spend, though, 25 years studying sea otters? That seems like an awful long time. Uh, you'd think I, one would know everything that there is possibly to know about sea otters after that time. And, and of course, we don't. Um, and they're fascinating animals. They're, they're all aspects of their behavior, their population biology um, is fascinating. And that alone would, would keep um, uh, any interested biologist studying them for 25 years. But in fact, that's not all we're studying. And, and the reason we um, have spent so much time and effort um, studying this particular organism is because we really use them as a window into how the nearshore ecosystem that they live in functions. Um, you can do that, of course, with, with many different species. But as I think you'll, hopefully you will see tonight, sea otters have sort of a unique place in that nearshore marine ecosystem uh, that most of you are familiar with any time you go to the ocean here. If you just look out that sort of first, you know, two, three hundred yards out to sea, 
That's the environment that sea otters live in. They don't go swimming, they're not like other marine mammals swimming hundreds of miles offshore. They spend their lives in that really narrow fringe of habitat um, that they basically share with us um, and with a lot of other creatures in that environment. And uh, as um, I'm gonna, my, the purpose tonight is to talk about the important ecological functions that they play in that, those ecosystems uh, and how we have learned about that uh, through a variety of different methods. Um, and I guess I also want to say that what I'm going to be presenting to you tonight is not my work at all. It's the work of an incredibly dedicated, collaborative team of people. So I just want you to imagine about 50 or 60 people sort of standing up here with me um, because it's really on, on their shoulders that, um, that I'm standing and, and presenting this work. Um, it's taken a long time and, and, uh, and I'm very proud of the things that we found, but it's definitely been a team effort. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into the confessions now. And I'm going to give you a little roadmap of what I want to try and cover tonight. Um, it's quite a bit of ground, and so I'm speaking slowly now, but by the end of the evening, I'm probably going to be talking very quickly, so, um, so be prepared. Um, the first uh, topic I'd like to cover is a bit of background context, um, and that is why the fuss about sea otters? Why, what are, do we even mean when we refer to them as a keystone species or a keystone predator? Um, and what exactly is a trophic cascade. So we're going to cover that, give you a little sort of a, um, a primary ecology lesson uh, on nearshore ecology and sea otter's role in that. And then with that background, we're then going to um, plunge forward into some of our current research projects um, here in California. Um, so the, the next topic will be San Nicolas Island, the return of the Keystone, some unexpected and unexpected patterns. San Nicolas Island is the most remote of the Channel Islands in the Southern California Bight. Most of you are, will be familiar with some of the other Channel Islands like San Clemente, Santa Rosa, San Miguel. Many of you won't know San Nicolas because you can't go there. Um, it's a Navy base and so um, getting out there basically involves that you either work for the Navy or you have permission for the Navy to get out there as we do um, to do research on, on some of the animals out there. So it's way, way out there, um, way offshore, straight off of Long Beach basically. Um, so, uh, and I'll, I'll give you more background about that island and about the unique population of sea otters out there and um, they're an experimental population um, that were translocated out there and what we have learned um, from that translocation. Um, and some of the things we've learned were things that we expected based on the theory that we covered in number one. Some of the things we found were very unexpected. Um, and so this third topic is going to sort of be delving into some of the complications and complexities of behavior that we think explain some of those unexpected patterns. And the particular complexities I'm going to cover um, today will be uh, individual diet specialization um, and the sort of unique spatial ecology of sea otters. Um, both those things uh, are topics that will make sense when, when we get there. Um, they're, they're topics that we've learned a great deal about over the last 20 years. We didn't know anything about 20 years ago. And as a result, a lot of our predictions, well, were frankly wrong because we really didn't account for those complexities of behavior. Um, so that will be topic three. And then finally, building on those complexities, I'm going to talk to you about some work, um, a project that's going on right now. We just started about a year ago. Um, some exciting and uh, quite remarkable changes happening in the nearshore uh, environment, really up and down the entire west coast of North America. We're studying it in depth right around the Monterey Peninsula. Um, it involves um, kelp forest urchins, sea otters, sea stars, and a lot of changes in that ecosystem. Um, and again, some unexpected findings that relate to those behavioral complexities. So there you go. There's a roadmap of what we're going to try to cover tonight, but we're going to start by way of an introduction. So first of all, what is a keystone species? And, and some of you here probably n know that already, but, um, but just in case, I'm going to sort of give you a brief definition. A keystone is generally understood to be a species, often a high trophic level consumer, that has a strong effects on community structure and dynamics, um, very strong relative to its abundance. Okay, so what do I mean by high trophic level consumer? Trophic is just a fancy way of uh, saying, um, food or eating. Um, so a trophic level is a level in a food web. A, a high trophic level consumer is something that is a predator up on to sitting up on top of the food web. Nothing eats it. It eats, every it eats things that are um, below it. So it's just sort of think of it as the capstone of a food web. Decades ago, it was generally understood in ecology that that capstone of a food web was kind of like an ornament on a Christmas tree. It, it looked pretty, but it didn't really do very much. And so, in fact, you could remove predators from ecosystems and not worry about having much of an effect. 
We now understand that to be completely and utterly wrong, and there are many cases now where we realize that those predators were not just ornaments, they were doing really important things. And when we remove them, whether those are grizzly bears or wolves, sea otters, coyotes, lots of other um, big species, um, mountain lions, that were removed from systems, uh, those systems changed in, in ways that were often unexpected and not always good for us. Um, and so over time, there's been a lot of movement to try and recover these top predators to, the, to their functional roles within ecosystems. Um, and some of those predators that are for the top systems have really, really big effects on their systems. That's like sea otters, and that's why we call them keystones. In many cases, what makes them a keystone is that they can trigger a shift in the ecosystem between alternative stable states. Okay, what do I mean by alternative stable states? I'm going to illustrate that with an example that's relevant to tonight. So if you go out to the rocky reefs that you can find offshore, um, if you go over to Santa Cruz or Monterey or anywhere along the coast um, here of California, some areas are sandy, but then you're going to see other areas where there's sort of rocky reefs, both onshore and offshore if you dive under the water. And if you do that, if you go out and you snorkel or dive down, you're going to find those rocky reefs in one of two basic states. Either they're going to be urchin dominated, that means there's going to be a lot of those things, purple or red urchins here. If you go farther north, they're going to be green urchins. There's different species of urchins, but in general, they're the dominant herbivore um, that, that, that graze down various types of algae that grow on the bottom. And so if you find it in an urchin dominated state, you're going to find little bits of kelp here and there, but for the most part, you're not going to find a ton of algae. And the algae you do find will most be small, low algae, like coral and algae. You'll find lots of um, urchins and then different species that go along with this. So there are a whole bunch of other invertebrates and some small fish, um, but it's going to be mostly uh, an invertebrate dominated community. Alternatively, you may go to that same reef at a different point in time, and you won't find it dominated by urchins, you'll find it dominated by kelps. So this is the kelp dominated state. And in this case, you're going to see large macroalgae, we call these giant kelp. Um, some species um, are, don't go to the surface, so they're subcanopy kelps. Other kelps grow up and form this dense layer along the surface of the water. We call those canopy forming kelps. But there's a host of other plants and animals that are living within that kelp forest, invertebrates and fish that rely on the structure of that kelp forest. Um, so in this kelp dominated state, it's not just the kelp that's different and not just the urchins that are different. It's really the whole suite of plants and animals that differ between these two states. And they're stable in the sense that once they're in one of those states, they tend to remain in those, one of that state for a long period of time. And it takes some sort of big perturbation to kick them from one state into the other state. So either state is stable, um, but it can, sometimes there's a big perturbation that can shift them from one state to the other. And one of those perturbations is the introduction of a keystone uh, predator. So the sea otter, being a keystone predator, as you might guess, is one of those things that can shift a rocky reef system from an urchin-dominated state to a kelp-dominated state. It does this um, primarily by eating a lot of urchins, more urchins than anything else. There are other species that do eat urchins, um, but they're just they're a tiny fraction of a percent as much as urchins as sea otters eat. And they, that's because they have such an incredibly high metabolic rate. So when otters come to a system, rather quickly it shifts from the urchin-dominated state to a kelp-dominated state. This paradigm is based on a suite of what I'm going to refer to as opportunistic experiments in Alaska and British Columbia. What do I mean by an opportunistic experiment? I mean an experiment that we really had no control of, although people did have control of um, this particular experiment because it was the North Pacific fur trade. So prior to uh, 1740, this is the Aleutian Island Archipelago in Alaska. There's the state of Alaska and that tail of Alaska stretching out towards Russia is the Aleutian Archipelago. And there's um, hundreds and hundreds of islands. They're, they're volcanic islands. They're very beautiful. Imagine Hawaii, but much windier and much colder. That's the Aleutians. Um, they're not, a, not a big tourist trade there. Um, they're, but they're gorgeous places. They're amazing. I've spent a lot of um, time up there. Prior to 1740, we know sea otters existed throughout that island because there are um, human midden sites on those islands from, from past, um, past civilizations, basically. Um, and they, in those midden sites, there's sea otter bones throughout the entire chain. So we know otters were present throughout the entire chain. 1740, something happened. It was the, the Bering expedition from Russia set out. Um, Vitus Bering and crew, including George Steller, 
set out from Russia, from Petropavlovsk, and came to Alaska. They only spent about 18 hours on the shores of Alaska, a pretty brief visit, although um, George Steller, the ship's naturalist, named lots of things after himself during that time. <laughs> Um, and then they turned around and headed back. And they didn't make it back that year. They were shipwrecked in Bering Island. Um, and actually, uh, Bering himself died on uh, Bering Island over that winter, as did a lot of others. But they, um, they did lots of things. They discovered the stellar sea cow, um, of which they ate a lot. And the stellar sea cow was due to go extinct in about 15 years after that, sadly. Um, they also hunted a lot of sea otters, and they brought back those pelts to Russia. And that set off the fur trade, the European fur trade, for the next 200 years. They became the most valuable commodity on the planet Earth. And so every major nation set out to get as many sea otter furs as they could. Um, and so by the time 1900 rolled around, sea otters were virtually extinct throughout their entire range in, uh, in the North Pacific, um, with the exception of a few little colonies where these arrows are pointing at places where we're pretty certain there were remnant colonies of maybe a few dozen animals. And these were generally places that you just couldn't get a ship because they're just too reefy. They couldn't anchor the ships there. So they couldn't get there to kill those last sea otters, which was very lucky for sea otters. Um, they were protected by international treaty in 1911. Um, and then they began to recover, um, as otters do often, or animals do that when you stop killing them. They're often pretty good at recovering. Um, and over the next 70 years, um, they recovered over much of the range in, in Alaska. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about their recovery in other places in uh, North America. Um, but in the Aleutian Islands, the Yellow Islands here are showing islands where by 1970 they were either growing or in some cases even stable populations of sea otters. They'd re already reached equilibrium at some, some islands. At other islands, they're at low density, and at many other islands, all these ones that are white, they hadn't reached there yet. And so what you have is a natural experiment, essentially controls and treatments of predator removals and then predator re returns to some of these islands. If you were going to do a huge Pacific-wide experiment, it might be something like that. Again, I don't recommend that, but that's what the fur trade had done. So um, we took advantage of that to, to do comparisons of the nearshore ecosystem at islands with sea otters, with abundant sea otters, with low density populations, and with no sea otters to see if they were different. And they were incredibly different. Um, and in fact, this was one of the things that led to the concept of these alternative stable states. Islands that didn't have sea otters um, universally looked like this. You could dive down anywhere around the island, anywhere you want, throw down a random site, and what you would find was solid carpet of urchins. Occasionally, there'd be a patch of rock that um, urchins can get to, usually because there's lots of sand around it um, that sort of protected it. And then you'd f find little patches of kelp. But for the most part, 99% of the habitat was urchin dominated. When you went to a um, islands such as Amchika, where uh, otters had recovered first and were already at high population density, it was completely different. When you dove down anywhere around the island, you found these thick, luxuriant kelp forests with a whole suite of different animals um, around them. And then over the um, otters were just arriving at Atu in 1972. And by the late 1980s, the Atu environment had shifted from this to this, to the kelp dominated. So it was actually a, a, an experiment to actually see what happened when you return sea otters to that environment. So really dramatic changes. And then in the late 1990s, well, actually, in the early 1990s, we were up there studying the populations at um, a couple of these islands, and Chica Island and Adak Island. Um, mainly, we were studying those populations because we wanted to compare a stable population with the population in California to get a sense of what was different about you know, a healthy, stable population. And surprisingly, it turned out, it, well, it started out, and the study started, they were healthy, stable populations, but, but something changed. And what changed was a behavioral innovation by another predator. Um, probably, uh, ultimately, just one pod of killer whales, although this probably spread, spread to other pods of killer whales by cultural transmission, discovered that they could go into kelp beds and eat sea otters, probably because a lot of their um, other prey, sea, stellar sea lions particularly, had been declining for the previous 20 years before that. Um, this behavioral innovation spread, as I mentioned, and killer whales ate a lot of sea otters. Um, so many, in fact, that they caused about a 90% population decline within just five years. So the population plummeted um, at these islands that we were working. And we just happened to, I mean, we could have missed it if we hadn't have been out there doing these studies. Um, but luckily we were, and so we saw this happening in real time. And so we were going around and surveying these islands as fast as we could to try and document what was happening. And what, you might, what was happening was what you might expect it would happen when you add another trophic level above the sea otters. 
The killer whales controlled the abundance of sea otters. Sea otters no longer controlled urchins. Urchins increased very rapidly because there's extremely high urchin recruitment in the Aleutians. Um, and the kelp was decimated. And so by 1999, all the sites that over the previous 50 years had transitioned from urchins to kelp, transitioned right back again to urchins. And if you go to any of the Aleutians today, um, anywhere in the range, you will see very, very little kelp. You'll just basically see these, these vast urchin barrens underwater. Um, so it's a very different situation. And that, again, gave us further understanding of how this, um, these, these uh, ecological interactions between sea otters and their prey and now their predators um, worked. So that same general paradigm seems to apply very well throughout Alaska, Southeast Alaska, British Columbia, there's been a lot of work over the last decade or so at the, looking at the recovery of sea otters there and the same phenomenon happens. As otters recover, urchins decline, the kelp forests come back, there's increases in rockfish and all the other species that depend on the kelp forest. Um, so it seems to be a pretty solid paradigm for the northern areas. Where it becomes more contentious um, and complex is in California. Um, in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a whole suite of papers coming, going back and forth arguing about how applicable this paradigm of keystone predators and alternative states was in California. It see, um, one of the arguments was just California was a lot more complicated and otters were just another brick in the wall. They weren't really, that was an allusion to a popular album at the time, of course. Um, that, that sea otters were really not more important than any other species. Others felt that, um, that they were and that uh, it might just be sort of a different um, aspect of that. And then that debate just kind of ended. It never really was resolved, although there's generally an assumption by most, most ecologists that otters do play a, um, an outsized role even here in California. But um, we realized we had a chance to sort of resolve this question through another opportunistic experiment, and this one um, a little bit uh, nicer than the fur trade. This was the translocation of sea otters out to San Nicolas Island, this rem most remote of the Channel Islands. And San Nicolas, um, this, the purpose of this translocation was not for the experiment, actually. The purpose of the translocation was to, as part of the recovery plan for the sea otters, it was realized that their distribution in central California matched that almost perfectly of the, the area affected by oil in the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So if there was an oil spill of the same magnitude as the Exxon Valdez, it could literally kill 100% of sea otters in California. And that was, of course, um, a concern. Um, because oil spills actually do happen, and they, we wish they didn't, but they, they happen periodically. So it was, um, it was decided by the Fish and Wildlife Service to establish an independent population geographically separated from this mainland population, essentially as an insurance. Um, so be, uh, before that translocation happened in the late 1980s, early 1990s, um, it was realized this would be an opportunity to experimentally see the effect of sea otters on the subtital community. And so um, a, a monitoring program was set up um, to, to study that subtital community around the island um, to see what sorts of changes would happen when sea otters were brought out there. Um, and this, the methodology was similar to the methodology we used in Alaska, which means lots of um, subtitle sampling like this, doing, setting down these, um, these swaths and random quadrats to measure the relative abundance of different species of plants and animals on the bottom. Uh, and, then, and then return to those sites year after year, actually two times a year, every spring, every fall, um, for the last 37 years, those sites have been sampled um, uh, by these techniques to look at community changes over time. And so that brings us to number two, San Nicolas Island, the return of the Keystone. Some expected and some unexpected patterns. So here's our crew, um, and actually a lot of these guys are, um, Mike, that's Mike Kenner in the center. Mike um, has been sort of heading up that sampling program since 1987. Um, he's got a few more gray hairs than he had back then, but don't we all? Um, and he's, this is uh, some, of, some of his younger folks um, here beside him. They're out there actually right now as we speak this week. Um, sampling, they're doing the intertidal sampling actually right now. Um, but they've been out there twice a year um, doing the, the work. And this is San Nicolas Island. As mentioned, it's a Navy base. You can see some of the, um, the landing strips there. Um, so uh, that means that it's very hard to get out there. Um, but also it means that it's, it's a great place to do research because there's not a lot of people there. It's highly protected. It's essentially a very pristine environment. If any of you have ever read um, The Island of the Blue Dolphins, that's the island of the Blue Dolphins where the lone women lived um, on that island. Um, and there's some really cool archaeological relics to do with that as well, but that's, that's a story for another day. Okay, so um, 
what our experimental treatment, again, is the addition of a predator to this um, island to see how it would change over time. And we had variation in the abundance of that predator, the sea otter, over both time and space. The over time, of course, is with a reintroduction and then their increase over time. I should mention that um, about 125 sea otters were initially brought out to San Nicolas Island. They, we discovered after that a, a really an amazing behavior that um, sea otters had was the ability to home back to the original, um, the original territories. <laughs> Even though they've been flown out in crates on a cargo plane, you know, hundreds of kilometers, they had an amazing ability to just like open it up and psh, off they'd swim 100 kilometers and they'd show back up in their territories, which is pretty amazing. Um, and some of, the, uh, some of the younger ones didn't find their way home and were returned a couple times. Eventually, about a dozen of them stayed. So by 1992, there were just 12 sea otters on the island. But they, as you can see from this chart, um, they increased over time and now we're up to almost 100 sea otters. Um, so it was, it was a slower increase than we expected, um, but nonetheless, they're now reaching the abundance that we would, might expect them to start having effects on the um, subtitle community. And uh, so that's the variation over time. The variation over space we were also not expecting. Um, we kind of expected, you know, the island's only, uh, uh, you know, about 20 kilometers long. We figured there'd be an equal effect of sea otters all the way around the island. Uh, turns out, no, that was not the case. Sea otters, what you see here is sort of a heat map showing the relative density of sea otters over time, with all these dots being sea otter groups um, over the last three or four years of surveys. And you can see they spend almost all the time out at the west end of the island. There's almost no use at all on the north side of the island, and very little use by sea otters of the southern and southwest side of the island. A little bit of use down here, especially in the winter when there's big storms. But for the most part, this is where sea otters are spending all their time doing all their feeding, and therefore that's where we'd expect them to um, be having effects. Um, so part of the paradigm, of course, re requires that sea otters would have their effects in the kelp forest by eating a lot of urchins. They, luckily, here's one thing that they, they did that we expected them to do at last. They, they did something, right? Um, they ate a lot of urchins. And we went out there in the early 2000s and conducted a study and looking at um, their, their movements, their behavior, their survival, their reproduction, and most importantly, their diet. And I'll tell you in a few, a few minutes how we do those dietary studies. Um, but basically, it turns out that about 80% of their diet were these, these big urchins, red urchins. There's also purple urchins out there. They didn't eat as many purple urchins because they like these big red ones because they're full of calories. They're, they're pretty big. They're just chock full of calories. They're like little energy bombs. Um, so about most of their diet, of the urchin diet, were these red urchins, but some purple urchins as well. Um, especially now that the red urchins are mostly depleted by sea otters, they're starting to eat more purple urchins. Okay, so what I'm now going to do is I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to walk you through the data from three of these sites around the island. Um, NAVFAC is the site along the north side of the island, or the north uh, east side of the island. And that's what you remember is where the otters have used that site hardly at all. So any change, variation we see here does not have to do with sea otters because they're just, they're just not there. The south side of the island, Dutch Harbor, there, we, there is some use by sea otters, though not nearly as much as the west end. Um, so we might expect them to maybe have some small effects there, but um, we, don't, we don't know that they spend enough time feeding there. And then the west end. This is where sea otters spend most of their time, so if there are going to be effects of sea otters in the um, subtitle community, we'd expect it to be out here. Okay, so how do we measure variation in the community state? I've been talking, uh, you know, mentioned the urchin dominated and kelp dominated, and I'm referring to sort of these alternative stable states. But when I'm talking about a community, and I'm of course talking about a huge suite of plants and animals that make up a community, okay? Um, so, to try and describe that, we have, a, we have a real challenge. We can actually show you individually variation, you know, a hundred different species, but that would be extremely confusing and hard to make any sort of sense of. So we use statistical techniques to sort of boil those down to a sort of a smaller conceptual and mathematical space that we can make sense of. And now let me explain. So that the technique is called non-metric multidimensional scaling, or NMDS. That's a mouthful, I know. Um, basically, but it's a mathematical approach using some other very illustrative terms like brace, Bray Curtis non-similarity indices and things like that to take a whole bunch of different dimensions and collapse those dimensions down into just two dimensions. It's a really neat trick. And in two dimensions, it's a lot easier to measure differences between communities. So each of these dots here could be a particular community, a particular reef at a, a given time and space, right? So community A and community B and community C, we'll call them. And what we can see from this simple graph now, 
Um, again, this is all of those different species boiled down into just two dimensions. Community A and community B are very similar because they're close together. Community C is different because it's farther apart. So that's all you really need to know is that these, two dimen these different dimensions are ways of looking at similarity or differences between communities um, over, over space and over time. So there's all the data in that two-dimensional, um, non-metric, multi-dimensional scaling space. Um, and it's still a big mess. And it's a big mess because I've, on purpose, I've thrown everything on there so it looks just sort of like the dog's breakfast, as they say. Um, but what you can see, if you start to sort of squint your eyes, you can see that there are certain clusters. So this is one, one of the sites, and you see that it's in one single cluster. That means over time, over 37 years, the community state stayed, for that particular site, stayed really similar in one place in time. And then another one of the sites, you see that it sort of clusters into three different groups. So that tells you that that community seemed to vary in different ways over time. And there were sort of three different clusters of community states over time. So that's just to sort of give you a preview. Now I'm going to actually start to delve into each one of these sites and kind of walk you through what happened and why we think it happened. So the north side, this is the NAVFAC site. First of all, I'm just going to show you this sort of spaghetti plot. It's just showing the relative abundance. Each line is showing you the relative abundance over time of one of the main species, the most dominant species in the community. Um, so we have Macrocystis, which is the giant kelp. That's the light green. Purple urchins is the purple line. Um, they're the, the most dominant um, grazer. Red urchins are the red line. As you can see, they're not very abundant relative to the purple urchins. And finally, the understory kelps, which is a whole suite of kelps that don't make it up to the surface, but they're, they're really important down low to the ground. Um, so so those are, you can see there's a lot of variation over time. Particularly, you can see there's these great big booms and crashes of the purple urchins. And a couple points in time, those purple urchins crashed down to almost zero. Um, and you might think, wow, is that driven by otters? But of course, then you remember, no, because the otters aren't there. Um, at least on the north side of the island. So it's probably not uh, sea otters causing those crashes. Um, in fact, what we think is driving those crashes is sea urchin disease. The, a disease is that when urchins are really abundant, sweeps through the population really fast, kills about 99% of the urchins. And then uh, in that brief time after all the urchins are gone, you have a little boom of kelp, but then the urchins begin to return. And so you see that subsequent increase. So, let's, so that's what we see when you sort of look at one species at a time. Now let's sort of go back out to this this two-dimensional NMDS space, um, the community space. And what to show you that this is actually a dynamic thing, I've arranged this incredibly complicated cartoon that you're going to see. This, I'm very proud of this animation. You can see up here, that little uh, rocky cartoon, there's our community right there, rocks and kelps and algaes and um, some other little things. And that community is going to show you, it's going to follow the trajectory of the actual community over 35 years, but it's going to do it really fast, much faster than 35 years. OK, here we go. Sitting some time over there, then over here, then down here, then back there, and then down, and that's where it finally ended up, right there. So you see that? Oops, we can even do it again. Again, this cluster, that cluster, back to this cluster, and down. So it seems that this, at this site, the community has transitioned between two different sort of clusters of community states. And each of those clusters might represent a particular sort of stable community state. In fact, it looks a lot like what we were describing as our alternative states. And when we look at the actual relative abundance of, say, some of the main species on there, so the size and color here is referring to the different species. So there's the purple urchins right there. There's the giant kelp right there. What you see is that the, the, the community cluster on the left is the urchin-dominated state. The community cluster on the right is the kelp-dominated state. So basically, this community was bouncing back and forth between urchin-dominated and kelp-dominated, but it was doing so without the help of sea otters. Um, so that was interesting. Then we go down to Dutch Harbor on the south side. And again, we're going to do this. I don't, this will go faster because you now know what everything means. Here again is the sort of those four dominant species. And you see a very different pattern. There's no huge crashes and booms of urchins. There's no huge crashes and booms of everything. Instead, you just sort of see fluctuation over time of all these species around sort of a stable point. And when we look at that in the NMDS space, um, we see a really different pattern. We don't see two different clusters and a community bouncing back and forth between them. In fact, we see there's really just sort of one cluster. That, uh, that, and the, uh, uh, we, we call this in ecology a basin of attraction, because you can kind of, um, you, you see these sort of contour lines I've drawn around here. Actually, those represent um, contours of a bivariate normal plot. 
Those contour lines sort of, you can think of it as a basin, and the community is caught in that basin. We call these basins of attraction. And when you have different stable states, you have two basins of attraction, and if you had a little ball in there, it, would, it could, might jump from one basin to another basin. Um, but it tends not to want to leave a basin. This community is stuck within one basin of attraction. Um, so that seems to, that t suggests it's a very stable place. And when we look at urchins and kelp, we see that they're both present within that basin. Um, so what defines Dutch Harbor is that it's the most um, topologically complex area. The, bo the bottom of that says there's huge pinnacles, there's all kinds of really cool rock formations, um, and in that complexity, there's sort of microhabitats for every different species. It's also the place where we have the most abundant fish populations. So there's, there's lots of kelp, there's certain, some pinnacles that the urchins sort of have taken over, and there's, so there's urchin areas, there's kelp areas, there's kind of everything within this one area. Um, so it seems that habitat complexity is really important in conferring stability to, uh, to different places. So that's the story of Dutch Harbor. Again, not much of a signal of sea otters at all. Probably not surprising because otters still hardly use that, that area. So now we come to the West End site. And again, just this little cartoon here is showing you the relative abundance of sea otters going from almost nothing up to about 70 otters that are feeding within the area of those West End subtitle sites. So we might expect if there's going to be an effect of sea otters that over the, the latter half of this period is where we might expect to see it. So let's start again. Let's look at these, those individual species. If you look just to the left hand of the side of the plot, you see something that looks a lot like NAVFAC. You see these bus, boom and bust cycle of the purple urchins with crashes suggestive of, of sea urchin disease. Um, and, and of course, after the crashes, you get a temporary boom in kelp. But then after the second crash of urchins around 2000, that crash was persistent. The urchins never bounced back from that crash. You do remember over in the north side of the island, they did bounce back. But here, once they got low, they stayed low. Um, why might that be? Well, remember, the sea otters are increasing over this time, and it may be that once the urchins got low enough in abundance, otters were, at this abundance, were able to control them and keep them down. Once they were down, otters kind of held them down. So now let's look at the community state. So we, I got our little, uh, our bouncing cartoon is back now. Um, and you'll notice this is a lot, a bit more complicated. Um, there's, rather than just two site, um, sites, it looks like there's really three. Two sites here and then this sort of additional um, sort of cluster of community states over to the right. So let's watch what happens. Yeah, and it looks like it's bouncing back between two and then it ends up over at that third site and the, the, uh, the growing otter is just um, showing the otter population. If you watch it again, it's bouncing back and forth between those two and then just right at the end it goes over to this new state that it hadn't been at um, ever before. And if we look at the relative abundance of, of um, some of the main constituents here, we see that left site is really the super urchin dominant site. Urchins are less abundant at the, at the site at the right. Kelp is more abundant, but kelp is even more abundant still at this far right cluster. And here's what's really interesting. The subtitle kelps become super abundant at this far right cluster that, um, that, that the community ended at. This is a greater abundance of these subtitle kelps than we've seen at any time anywhere around San Nicolas over the last 37 years. And it seems to be something that's due to the recovery of sea otters at that site. Once they kept urchins low for long enough, then you have competition between the kelps, and then those subtitle kelps eventually begin to outcompete the macrocystis, and you have a, a whole new kelp community beginning to uh, occur. So in summary, San Nicolas Island, what did we learn? Well, we, we learned that we were wrong about a lot of our expectations. It's always a good thing to learn. Um, we learned that subtitle communities did indeed shift between alternative states at some sites. Um, however, the number of basins of attraction varied between different sites. Some sites, there's only one basin of attraction and the community stayed there the whole time. Other locations, the, um, there was indeed a fluctuation between kelp and urchin dominated, but otters did not seem to be necessary to be driving that. Looked like, uh, looked like disease could play a role. However, sea otters probably did play a role in driving that west end site to a whole new state that we hadn't seen before, characterized by really abundant understory kelps and fleshy red algae. Um, so again, other factors also mediate state shifts like ha habitat complexity and disease. And the high site fidelity of sea otters also made their impacts a lot more localized than we had expected when we set out at the beginning of this experiment. So why are, otter, why are otters so local? Why aren't they just feeding all around the, uh, around the island? Well, that sort of gets at topic number three, the, comp the complications added um, from behavior. And I'm going to talk a little bit both about the spatial ecology of sea otters, but also about this phenomenon diet specialization. 
So to, you know, before I get to what I mean by that specialization, I'm going to give you a really quick crash course in sea otter foraging ecology. This has been something that we've been looking at a lot over the last 20 years with sea otters. And in fact, I would say out of um, all large carnivores, we probably know more about sea otter diets and foraging behavior and foraging ecology than any other large carnivore, terrestrial or marine. And the reason I say that is because otters are pretty unique for any carnivore, again, terrestrial or marine. They dive down to the bottom to get their food and we can't really see that part, but then they bring it all to the surface and they eat their prey lying on their backs, holding it up on their chests, um, eating it. And they often even do this thing where they actually hold it up so we can see it. So if you're unsure with a telescope, you can see every single prey that they bring up. You can even measure it relative to their paw width. And we know, we, since we've measured a lot of sea otter paws, we know exactly how wide each paw is. So they have a little ruler, they measure the prey for us, then they eat it. Um, so basically, they're, they're, it's, it's almost kind of crazy. They're, they're just this perfect thing to measure how much different food of different types that they're consuming. Um, and so we've, uh, we've obliged them by, um, by studying that um, over the last 20 years, and we've learned a lot um, about that. And so we've, one of the first things we wanted to do um, as we studied this was sort of compare them to forging theory. And forging theory, suggests that predator populations, as they um, increase in abundance, uh, are expected to expand their dietary niche as their preferred prey become depleted. Basically, as you have an increase in intraspecific competition, you expect more and more um, less preferred prey to, be, to enter into the diet, and therefore an increase in their dietary niche. Um, so when food abundance is really low, when, as the populations reach carrying capacity, we expect to see the most diverse diets. Um, so we, did, uh, we were working on, I did my PhD actually in the early 2000s, doing exactly this, comparing different sites that were at different abundances, including Alaska, but also in California, to see if sea otters fit this pattern. Um, so how do we actually go about um, collecting these data? Well, we can, you can go and measure, one, one way you can do it is just go and collect data from untagged otters, and we do a lot of that actually, especially in places in Alaska. But here in California, where it's possible actually to go out and capture these otters and tag them, you can actually learn a lot more when you follow individually marked animals over time. And this is true of a lot of different wildlife studies. Studying tagged animals over time is how we learn about survival, reproduction, foraging ecology, movement ecology, all kinds of different things. So to capture sea otters, there's a, we have a technique that's been um, sort of perfected over many decades um, using scuba divers with specialized equipment. They're rebreather equipment, so there's no bubbles, so sea otters can't smell them from underneath. Um, and these um, electric scooters with traps attached come up underneath, capture them in the trap. We then bring them uh, ashore either to the Monterey Bay Aquarium if we're in Monterey or to a ship if we're somewhere else. Um, we tag them, we take a bunch of different samples, uh, and then we return them to the wild. And we study them for about the next three to five years, um, or as long as we can. And we collect a lot of different data, like their movements and their, their survival, their behavior, their interactions, um, but particularly their foraging ecology. And this is all you need. There's, um, there's Michelle Stedler from the aquarium with a high-powered telescope and some radio tracking equipment, collecting data on a sea otter and recording what it's consuming. Um, as well as the observational data, we also, um, for a smaller subset of animals, we deploy these time depth recorders. That gives us information on how deep they're diving, how long they're diving, um, and a variety of other information. And when we have the otters in hand, as well as taking all our measurements and, and samples, one of the samples we take is a single whisker. And the whiskers go back pretty fast. Um, so, but I wouldn't want someone pulling my whisker, but they are unconscious when we do it. Um, and that whisker is very valuable because it gives us about a year and a half record of the life of the animal of what the animal was eating. Um, and in fact, if I did go out and pluck one of your whiskers, um, I could analyze it in a similar way with stable isotope analysis, and I could see what you've been eating over, the over some period of time. Depends how long your whiskers are. Um, but with sea otters, we know that those whiskers take about a year and a half to grow. So it gives us this record in, of the, uh, in the life of their diet. We can compare back to the foraging, the observational behavior to, um, as sort of a, a test to make sure what we're seeing um, is reflective of what the animal's doing. So diet diversity um, in different types of populations, we compared a number of different populations of different density. And here I'm showing you a low density, rapidly growing population, San Nicolas, where we believe food was really abundant, compared to San Simeon, um, a place in the middle of the range, high density, where we believe the preferred prey was depleted. And the patterns are exactly predicted by foraging theory. We have a low density, at the low density population, we have a very low diversity diet, dominated by red urchins, the most profitable prey. And at the high density site where preferred prey are depleted, you see this um, diverse diet. But when you look at individual animals, 
we saw something that we were not expecting. Um, and these, I should mention, are three adult females and just pretty much selected at random. You could choose any three females. These ones I chose specifically because their home ranges were perfectly overlapping. They basically had the exact same home range. They rested every day in the same kelp beds. And yet, when you looked at their diet collected over a five-year period, they're almost completely non-overlapping. They're eating completely different things. Um, even though, so it's not because they're, using, they're living in different areas. It's not because they're different ages. They just have completely different diets. Um, and so this greater diversity we see at the population level is not being driven by every otter becoming a generalist. It's actually being driven by every otter becoming a specialist, but different otters are specializing in different things. Um, we, were, we were quite um, gobsmacked when we found this. I, I can say it in the, uh, this was in the early 2000s. And we published this, and right around the time we published this, there's a couple other publications came at the same time, and it kicked uh, on other species showing similar patterns, and that kicked off a whole flurry of studies of people going out to their own study organisms and marking their animals and, follow, and following them over time. And it turns out this is a really general phenomenon. It's not just sea otters. It's not just one or two species. This sort of individual diet specialization is pretty ubiquitous in nature. And that, I mean, it seems surprising at first, although we specialize, if, if you think about it. And so I, I think we sort of thought, well, we're special. You know, we do things. We, animals, you know, they're all the same. They're just kind of like machines. But no, they're, they're a lot like us. Um, they d different individuals develop different preferences and they do different things. Um, so we've done a, a number of different studies of this phenomenon. And as we've looked at different populations, we, what we found consistently here in California, and we have less data from northern populations, although we see the same types of phenomenon uh, places we've looked in Alaska, um, where populations are reaching high density. But here in California, there's six different sort of diet modules or diet specialization types that we see consistently up and down the coast, wherever you go. And they occur in about the same frequency. So you have urchin specialists, mussel specialists, crab specialists, abalone specialists, turban snail specialists, and then soft sediment specialists that feed on a variety of clams, fat and keeper worms and other species that you find in soft sediment um, type habitats. And these, these different, as mentioned, these specialist types seem to occur pretty predictably um, at every, uh, all the different areas that they occur. Um, so that is really intriguing. Um, this, the one question is, um, might we just be being biased by our observational data? Um, that's what, it's good that we have the stable isotope data when we look at that. Do they tell the same story? Yes, they do. They tell exactly the same story. When we look at, um, so what you, this is um, showing you the relative um, abundances of stable, in one whisker over a year and a half period of um, stable isotopes of nitrogen and carbon, which may not mean a lot. So if we translate this into isotopic space, each one of these circles is an animal. Um, in the center of the range or areas where there's high density populations, you see there's very little overlap between otters in terms of their isotopic space, their, their, which is, corresponds to their foraging niche. Um, but when you go to a place like San Nicolas where food is abundant, there's a lot of overlap. Basically, all animals have these overlapping isotope niches because they have similar diets. And we've, seen, we've actually now seen some of these switch from this to this as the population become more abundant. So this, the isotopes confirm what we've been seeing with the, the observational data. So, so why are we seeing this? Why specialize when prey becomes scarce and not when prey is abundant? The answer, we believe, um, well, there's sort of an ultimate and proximate answer. The ultimate answer is it improves their foraging efficiency. Specialists are just really good at what they do. Um, approximately, a lot of females are specializing in what their mothers are, are specializing on. So they get a head start in life learning from their mothers because they spend six months with their mothers learning to feed. Um, and so a lot of we, what we found is a lot of females, um, more so than you would expect by chance, tend to specialize in the same prey that their mothers specialized on. So it's essentially a cultural transmission of foraging. Um, and it's not 100%, so some females end up specializing in different prey. But it's, um, it's definitely a tendency. But what we, the thing that is consistent is when we compare the speed of prey handling, so like for instance this animal um, who's handling a, uh, um, a saxonomous clam, or if it's a clam specialist or whatever it's feeding on, if you compare the rate at which they're handling prey to generous or other, other non-specialists who just feed on that prey occasionally, they're about 40 to 50% faster. That means they're consuming 40 to 50% more kilocalories per unit time. Um, so the, the reason they're specializing basically is because it's energetically profitable for them to do so. They learn, um, even though they are foregoing some prey, they actually do better by just specializing the prey that they're good at. And it means that they're more likely to ignore prey that they're not specializing on. 
This leads to um, a number of different uh, and unexpected predictions. One is that it's going to greatly uh, increase the complexity in food web interactions. It's going to make our job a lot harder trying to make predictions from food webs because we can no longer assume that a predator is just like a single node interacting with different prey species. Now we have to think of it as actually a whole bunch of different nodes interacting with different prey species. And that can, that can differ over time and space and, again, make our job a lot harder. But more interesting, um, it also um, had some unexpected uh, um, advantages. Around the same time we were doing this work, we were actually doing some disease studies trying to understand how certain types of infectious diseases that occur on land were getting into marine food webs and affecting a variety of species, including sea otters. Um, this was uh, a couple of these were protozoal pa um, parasites, Toxoplasma gondii and Sarcosisnus neurona, both of which can cause brain infections. Um, and they're both terrestrial parasites. They're, the, for Toxoplasma, the dominant, uh, the, uh, the ultimate host is members of the cat family, so wild felids like mountain lions, um, bobcats, and domestic cats. And in the case of Sarcosisnus neurona, um, the, uh, the ultimate host is the opossum, so it's, which is an invasive species. So in both cases, these are not parasites that you might expect to find out in a kelp forest, and yet we are finding them in a rather large proportion of sea otters. Um, and other marine species, as mentioned, that we're having infections from these species. We're trying to figure out essentially the mechanisms by which they're getting from land into the ocean and into these marine food webs. As, and, uh, as mentioned, so we're doing these studies, and at the same time we're finding this diet specialization, we're working on epidemiological models with, um, with colleagues at UC Davis, and we thought, why not just throw in diet specialization into the mix and see if maybe that'll explain some of it. And we did, and it explained almost all of it. Almost all variation in terms of infection rates, it turns out, was explained by what diet specialization that particular otter had. Um, so, for instance, in the case of Toxoplasma gondii, snail specialists were 12 to 24 times more likely to be infected with Toxoplasma gondii than were all the uh, otters from any other diet specialization. And we found, and in the case of Sarcosisnus neurona, it was actually um, clam particularly razor clams, but clam and worm specialists that had that much higher prevalence of infection. So it turned out, we, we realized, and uh, we, we published this in this paper, Prey Choice and Habitat Use Drive Sea Otter Pathogen Exposure, we realized that this, this finding of diet specialization had given us a whole new tool to try to understand how different types of diseases and, in fact, pollutants were getting from the land into the sea and particularly into marine food webs just by knowing the different prey that they're consuming and the different microhabitats that they were utilizing. Um, so we've, been, we've had many other studies following up on these findings. So that's a little bit um, a crash course in diet specialization. So I mentioned diet specialization. I also, we talked about um, high site fidelity. Why are sea otters um, so essentially such stay-at-homes? Why, particularly for the females, why do they um, have such small home ranges? We now believe that actually has to do with this high site, uh, this uh, diet specialization. And we believe that actually because the animals that have the, the most dietary specialization tend to have the most constrained home ranges. Males that have less diet specialization move over much greater areas. Um, and that's probably because they can consume, they can switch to different, different types of prey when they're in different areas. Females, once they specialize in a prey, are pretty much locked in to not only their particular prey, but also to the habitat that they're very familiar with. Um, and so what we find with adult females is that over their entire lifetime, they live within about 10 to 20 kilometers of coastline. So there's the lifetime home range for one female right around Carmel Bay, going, just going, going from uh, um, Cypress Point here, at the golf club over there, through Car Stillwater Cove, Carmel Bay, down to Point Lobos. And that's, she, won't, she doesn't go beyond that. She's never been over to Cannery Row. And she's never been down to Big Sur, poor girl. Um, and, that, that's, and that's completely normal and typical of all other adult females. So when you go and look at the population at Big Sur, or, well, Big Sur or Monterey or, down, or drive down to San Simeon, you're looking at completely distinct sea otter populations. It's not just one population of animals swimming and mixing all the time. These are essentially, you can sort of think of these as villages between which there's a little bit of movement of, um, of a few males, but for the most part, they're completely different animals. They probably speak different languages. Um, and that's, uh, that's really fascinating. And it also has really important implications um, for both the regulation of the population. It means they're going to be regulated locally, not at large scales. And also for their ecological effects. And that sort of explains what we were seeing at San Nicolas, why it was so localized to one part of the island. 
I mean, so that's what, what we, one of the terms we use for that is cryptic demographic structure. When you look out at the population, you see what appears to be just a solid continuous band of otters, but in fact, what, what you're not seeing is that that's actually broken up by this sort of cryptic hidden structure throughout the population. Um, and we're actually now doing some genetic studies and, find, and those are supporting this um, completely genetically as well. So there's this um, genetic diversity that varies over the course of the population. So, with, armed with this behavior, uh, this complexities of behavior and this new knowledge, um, I'm going to now tell you about a study, that, uh, a final project that we're doing right now. Um, it, it was another unexpected opportunistic experiment that presented itself to us. Um, and we're using our knowledge of diet specialization and, and spatial ecology to try and understand how sea otters are res responding to this perturbation, how the ecosystem is responding. Um, and what we're learning is that, uh, again, what, seen, what we thought was a pretty simple trophic cascade of sea otters, urchins, and kelp is not at all as simple as we thought. So here's the Monterey kelp forest. And if you went and uh, put on a mask and snorkel and dove down, um, went off of Cannery Row or Point Pinos or anywhere along the shoreline there, this for about 50 years from about 1960 when sea otters arrived for the first time um, up to the present, this is what you would see pretty much everywhere. This beautiful kelp forest, tons of fish and uh, different invertebrates. Um, and that was seen, and we kind of assumed that was the way it was going to be forever um, until it wasn't. And in about 19, uh, 1940, 2014, we started to see this, particularly around Carmel Bay, but it quickly spread all around 17 mile drive. And then, around, and then came around the corner, now right off Hopkins, we're seeing this and spreading down towards the, the aquarium in Monterey, uh, Monterey Bay Inn. These urchin barrens that uh, aren't supposed to occur where sea otters are abundant, um, they haven't read the textbooks and they're occurring all over the place. Um, so we kind of uh, had to go back to the old drawing board and figure out what was going on. And uh, we, did, we do, did what scientists often do, is we quickly sat down and wrote some grant proposals. And um, amazingly, one of them was funded. So um, this is a, an ongoing study that, um, we're doing. Uh, it's a collaboration between myself and Mark Carr, who's a professor at the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at, at Santa Cruz, um, to basically understand the potential role of predator complementarity um, and, in affecting ecosystem resilience in California kelp forest. So I'll, I'll explain what I mean about predator complementarity in just a second. So again, starting 2014-15, many areas transitioned to this from kelp-dominated state to the urchin-dominated state, even though sea otters were abundant and they, they weren't supposed to do that. Possible causes, well, one of the possible causes was something that you might have heard about, the blob, this big warm water mass that set off a large portion of North America for, the last, um, for a few years, actually, 2014 and 15. Um, and that blob changed a lot of oceanographic patterns. And one of the things we thought it might have done was increased recruitment of urchins. So maybe there's just a lot more baby urchins. That is certainly might have contributed a bit, although the pattern we saw in these urchin barons was not just a whole bunch of little ones. It was all different size classes. And they can't get to a big size class that fast. So it turns out that the increased recruitment explanation is not capable of explaining the speed with which we saw the transition to urchin barons. The other possibility, um, is another phenomenon that happened, started in 2013, went through right, well, right through the present actually, but 2013 and 14 were the big years for this, and that was the loss of predatory sea stars from, from uh, waste and disease. So this beautiful animal you see here is a sunflower star, Pycnopodia. You wouldn't see, these are different than the stars you'd see in tide pools. These are subtitle stars, so they occur deeper. Although you might be lucky enough to see one occasionally, and if you go out diving or snorkeling, you can see, well, you used to be able to see these. They are gorgeous, they're quite big, um, and they're voracious, ter um, terrifying predators on sea, of sea urchins. When these guys come over a reef, all the urchins literally flee. They run away on the little tube feet as fast as they can. And there, there's pictures of these that it's just incredible. You'll see these in the reef, as there might be five of them, and around each of them there's this halo formed by a lack of urchins as the urchins are fleeing as fast as they can. Um, so these guys are, yeah, these are basically Godzilla to urchins. <laughs> To little urchins, they can't eat the really big urchins, they're size limited, but they eat the little ones and the, and the, and the middle sized ones basically up to about that size. Um, so gorgeous animals, great predators, um, except in 2013 this started happening to them. Um, they melted and became piles of ooze. And this happened to 100% of Pictopodia between Mexico and Southeast Alaska. Uh, it also happened to almost all other sea stars as well. There's a few different species like bat stars that survived a little bit, but basically 99.9% .9 of sea stars 
of all species from Mexico to Alaska died over about a, a one to two year period from sea star wasting disease. So if you happen to be in tide pools over the last few years and noticed you weren't seeing any sea stars, it's not just you, they're gone. Um, and this is one of, one of the most dramatic events that, you know, that I've seen within my lifetime. Um, there's been diseases like this before, but never this broad and this you know, complete. There are some species coming back, um, particularly up in Alaska in the northernmost part, not Pycnopodia yet. Um, we've been talking to our colleagues and, and hoping we're going to start to see these again soon, but, uh, but no sign of them as yet. So we saw, occasionally we see one or two um, ones that look like they're coming back, but then they die of the disease still. So the, the virus is still out there. So that was, um, that was a remarkable thing to witness, but the question is, did that have something to do with the uh, increase in urchin variants? Well, it seems like it might, given that these are another predator of urchins. Um, but again, even though everyone who studies these knows they eat urchins, no one thought that they were nearly as important as sea otters in limiting urchin abundance. What we're wondering is whether these guys were sort of like the hidden, the hidden sidekick of sea otters. Sea otters, you know, get all the credit for limiting urchins, but uh, up until the sea star wasting disease, Pycnopodia were always there. They're, you know, right, they're sort of like Batman and Robin here, and they're the kind of the hidden Robin. Um, that while well, otters get the credit for eating all the big urchins, those Pycnopodia were busily eating away all the little and little and uh, middle-sized urchins. And maybe for really effective control of urchins, you need to have both sea otters and stars in the population. So that's um, what our primary hypothesis that we want to investigate with this project. Um, but we're also really interested in, in why sea otters were not able to respond faster um, to this increase in urchin abundance. And we're wondering if it has to do with some of these behavioral complexities that I've mentioned before. Um, in fact, uh, so particularly, does dietary specialization in this population, in this abundant population at Monterey, actually inhibit their ability to keep up with the increase in sea urchins? Okay, so I'm gonna, now this brings us to the concept of predator complementarity. Um, what exactly do I mean that? There are three different ways that, two, that if you have two different predators, sea otters and sea stars, that, they can, that those two predators together can affect urchins. One way is that their effect on urchin abundance can be additive. So if otters um, have this much of an effect on urchin abundance and sea stars have this much of an effect on urchin abundance, when you have otters and sea stars together, you basically just add up their, their mortality rates and there you have the total effect on sea stars. Um, another idea, though, is this, multiplicative, and that is that the sum of sea otters and sea stars together is greater than their independent contributions to limiting urchins. So when they're both together, they have a much greater effect on limiting urchins than you would expect um, as based on either one of them by themselves. And of course, the third possibility is the opposite. That would be interference, competition, so that when otters or sea stars are by themselves, they have one effect, but when they're together, they inhibit each other, and so therefore their, their ability to control urchins is even less than you'd expect um, as compared to the additive. We're pretty sure this is not happening, but what we're wondering is whether this is happening, is whether otters and er sea stars together um, do a better job of, of limiting urchins and therefore conferring resilience to the kelp forest um, than they do when either one of them is all by themselves. And again, We've never seen this before, simply because stars have always been there. They're, you know, they're, we sort of, they're, they're the old reliables, right up until the time that they weren't. So, um, to answer this, we're, doing, we're getting about it in a couple of different ways. Again, we're doing, aside from writing grant proposals, another thing ecologists love to do is to do these types of experiments. Um, so we're setting up these underwater cages just off of, if you go to Cannery Row, um, and you look off, you'll see a bunch of different buoys, but one of those little buoys is marking our subtitle cages. So right out, out there underwater, there's 20 of these cages right now set up, and they're, they're set up not over existing reefs. We had, we had to build our own reefs, so we set these up outside the rocky reef. We built our own rocky reefs inside each one of these cages, within which we can stock a known number of sea urchins. And then some of those cages we can place we were hoping by this time that the, the Pycnopodia would have recovered. They haven't, so we're having to use some other surrogate star species in place of Pycnopodia until such a time as they do recover. Um, so we have some treatments where we have stars but not otters and we keep the otters out because we can put covers over those cages. Um, these are, again, these are, these are all cyclone fencing um, so, so that uh, the water can move through, through there but we can keep sea otters out. We can have stars and otters by having the cage open or we can have otters only by having the cage open and not putting stars in and we know no stars will go in by themselves because there are no stars. Uh, and then we can have um, no stars and no otters. And by this sort of fully factorial experiment, we can actually measure the independent feeding rates of uh, otters and stars by themselves or together. And we can sort of get at, at this idea of 
complementarity versus additiveness. And this is what they look like underwater on a kind of a sedimenty day, so it's muddy, but this is when we're actually in the process of moving the great huge rocks into the, uh, into the fenced enclosures, which was a monumental task. Um, <laughs> but now they're out there and there's like, there's little uh, webcams set up uh, on these to record when otters come in there and we're already beginning to find some cool things. But I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna tell you about that part yet, you're gonna have to wait to a future talk until we have all our results in. But I can tell you it's gonna be, it is really cool. Um, so, the other part of the study though is to actually look at what's happening on, on top of the surface. What's happening with the sea otters? So, we did what we've done in the past. We went out, we tagged 25 otters, and now and we're following them over time and recording their diet. And because we have this historical diet at Monterey, we can sort of see are there changes um, in both the abundance of otters and the diet of sea otters and the survival of sea otters and all these other parameters over time in response to this increase in urchins. So one of the first things we did see was an increase in the abundance of otters that seemed to track, and this is just specifically at Monterey Peninsula, that seemed to track the, um, the decline of sea stars and the increase in urchin abundance. Um, and this increase um, appeared when we went out and actually did surveys of these groups. What we saw was a lot of juvenile and subadult animals. Um, and these are animals that basically had grown up in this urchin-rich environment. And we, started, we, we coined the term urchin millennials. Um, because, not because they were looking at their phones all the time, but because they were eating, they were young, millennials, and they were eating a lot of urchins. Um, but, uh, so, so that was kind of interesting. So we see, this is what we would call a numerical response. That is, um, the response of the population in abundance to the increase in prey. The other thing we might expect is what we call a functional response, and that's not changing the numbers, but rather a change in the behavior of the otters that are there. And what we might expect, of course, is an increase in the amount of urchins in the diet, if they're going to respond, again, to this, this glut of urchins. And when we looked at the population level, in fact, we did see that. When we compared the proportion of urchins in the diet um, from 2004 to 2012, urchins made up only just about 5 or 6% of the diet. And why so small? Because there just weren't many urchins. Um, but from 2016 to 17, they've increased not to like 100% of the diet, what, like you might expect given the, their super abundance, but at least to about 15 to 17% of the diet. So that is about a doubling of the, in terms of the proportion of sea urchins um, in the population level diet consumed by sea otters. We also saw more size selectivity. So urchin otters always tend to choose the most energy rich of the uh, um, prey types. And with more urchins available, um, they're able to be more selective. And so instead of just eating all urchins, they're tending to eat the, the larger urchins. Um, so this is predictable perhaps based on sort of the optimal foraging um, behavior of sea otters, but it means that they're not gonna be doing a very good job at controlling the small urchins when they're just limiting themselves to eating the big ones. Okay, so if there's more urchins in the diet, does this mean that all otters are just eating a little bit more urchins? Or does it mean just a few otters are eating a lot more urchins and other otters are not changing their diets at all? So in other words, has there been a change in the degree of diet specialization at Monterey? So one of the ways you can measure this statistically is um, with a statistical metric called the proportional similarity index. And it's basically just a number that allows you with one number to, determine, to distinguish between um, generalize, generalize, generalization would be a, when you have high numbers of the index means that no individuals are specializing right down to extreme specialization as you approach zero. Um, so if there's, we, what we would expect if all otters were becoming more generalized and just starting to consume more urchins is that this line should go up. And does it? No, it does not. It remains exactly the same. So that means that the level of individual specialization has not changed at all in the face of this increase in urchins. Um, and in, the, in particular, some of the otters that we had, the older animals that we had tagged from previous studies, they just continued doing what they'd always did. So the crab specialists kept specializing in crabs. Snail specialists just kept specializing in snails. They weren't increasing their consumption of urchins at all. Um, so that actually sort of confirmed one of our hypotheses that in fact, um, specialization does inhibit the ability of sea otters to respond um, to a sudden perturbation in terms of the increase of, in urchins. However, uh, what we did, the change that we did see was an increase in the proportion at the population level in the proportion of animals specializing in urchins. Um, and you can see this is, uh, um, these, each of these uh, clusters of bars is just showing you the proportion of each specialist type. So we have generalists, abalones, cancer crab, clams, kelp crabs, mussel, um, I can't, something I can't even read from. Yeah. Thank you, snail, <laughs> and urchins. And what we see is that an increase in the uh, frequency of both urchin specialists and mussel specialists 
uh, in the diet. And by the way, mussels are another thing that have increased in abundance with the loss of stars, and that's primarily from the loss of um, pisaster that are mussel consumers. So there's a lot more mussels and urchins, and that means there's more urchin and mussel specialists, but all these new specialists are younger animals, basically. So the older ones just kept on doing what they're doing, and it's these younger millennials as they come up in the population, and they're, they're born into a world where there's just tons of urchins and tons of mussels, and not surprisingly, that's what they're choosing to specialize on. Um, so those are some of the complexities we're seeing. One, uh, one final thing we're looking at, again, is this idea of selectivity by um, otters. When you have urchin barrens, um, and those urchin barrens get big enough, the urchins in the middle of the barrens don't have any kelp to eat, basically. So they're, they're, just, they're, they're sort of in the middle of an urchin desert. They're, they're feeding a little bit of coral and algae, but basically they have almost nothing to eat. And with urchins, unlike with homeotherms, that's not a problem. When you don't have anything to eat, you can just sort of remain in the state of suspended animation basically forever, um, because they, they can just turn their metabolic rates down to zero. Um, so, but what it does mean is when you look inside those urchins, you see almost exactly nothing. You see a, a few little structures, but it's mostly just hollow. Um, when you go to the edge of the urchin barrens where they're grazing on kelp, then they're full of, um, they're mainly full of gonads, basically. They're, they're, they're eating up tons of food, producing gonads and eggs, and then and making more little baby urchins. Um, so otters, being clever like they are, are not going to be eating the empty urchins. They're going to be tend, we would expect them to feed on the urchins that are full of energy. Um, so we're testing that by recording all the places that otters are feeding, where we see them, um, our tagged otters eating urchins, and then we have a dive team go in that same day, dive at that exact spot and compare, um, take a selection of urchins, measure their, um, their gonad index, their, their composition, and then go do random sites all around and we compare that. And what we're finding basically is none of our tagged otters are feeding in the urchin barrens. They're just feeding along the edges with, and again, they're doing what you might expect a smart otter to do. They're feeding on the urchins that are in the kelp that are full of energy and they're ignoring the ones in the barrens. And that's again going to be problematic in terms of otters limiting these urchin barrens because they're just not going to be feeding there. Um, so these are all some of the dynamics that we're, we're measuring right now at the site. So I think at this point I have to wrap it up. Um, so I'm going to uh, sort of step through some our overall conclusions um, from what we've learned and sort of try, trying to tie together these, um, these different studies. So in general, sea otters in fact do exert very strong influences on nearshore communities. Um, and I, and I, you know, I didn't cover all the different ways that they affect it, but as you saw from those, those studies in Alaska and British Columbia, they can completely change the nature of the ecosystem. Today I didn't talk about some of the, another study we're doing in Alcorn Slough, but we're finding in that study, we found that sea otters have similar really big effects in soft sediment estuarine systems as well. We've seen an increase in the eelgrass as otters moved into that system um, from a very different trophic cascade, and that's sea otters controlling uh, cancer crabs. But in any event, something that is unique about sea otters is their ability to really shake things up, basically. And again, that really all comes back to their incredibly high metabolic rate. When otters come into the system, they tend to change it dramatically. However, that said, that simple cartoon that we had before of just otters come in, urchins disappear, kelp forests, that, as, as with many simplified cartoons, that turns out to be a little bit too simple. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Um, and particularly in California, where there's a lot more species, we're finding that behavioral complexities of otters, um, in, in particular the diet specialization and site fidelity, fidelity, and also the fact that there's multiple predators, not just otters, that are controlling urchins, um, are affecting the, the, the degree to which sea otter, these sea otters are having their food web impacts. And it looks like sea otters interacting with other predators, particularly with Pycnopodia, the, the giant sea star, um, might be what um, leads to really effective control of urchins and, and kelp forest resilience in California. We, know, we don't just need one predator, we need multiple predators. And finally, I guess, uh, sort of to take a big step back, um, one of the things that uh, I can sort of say after 25 years of studying these guys is that um, being wrong is okay. In fact, it, it has to be okay. You don't have much choice with otters. They, they love to prove you wrong. Um, but ecological surprises, um, and, those are, and that's how we characterize all the different things that we found with these otters, are really, really useful learning opportunities. Um, and so one of the things when you're, um, for any, any wannabe ecologist in the crowd is um, be attuned to these ecological surprises because when things, unexpected things happen, that's an opportunity to learn something new that you didn't uh, know before about the, uh, about the ecosystem. And with that, I would like to say thank you 
um, to all the different groups providing funding for all this research. And of course, for all, the, all my collaborators and the field assistants and graduate students and all the different people that made all this work possible. Um, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Tim. If you'd like to ask a question, I want to ask you to please go to the microphone in the stand. Our online listeners can hear you. Well, I was wondering if the, er, um, the otters that specialize in their diet are more at risk if, if the prey they prefer goes away or becomes not abundant. That's a, it's a great question. And in fact, that's why, if you look at those bar graphs, you'll notice there's generally one or sometimes two dominant prey we call those their core prey species. But then you notice that there's, it's not like they weren't eating anything else at all. And that's, I, we, we refer to those as their peripheral prey species. Um, and if they were true specialists, like a snail, a snail specialist would eat nothing but turban snails, 100%. And they don't. They eat about, uh, snail specialists are probably the most specialized. They eat about 60 to 70% snails. But then that means they're eating 30 to 40% other stuff. And, and that other stuff is pretty much everything else. So they are, in fact, always sampling their environment. Um, and under extreme circumstances, of course, when their prey completely disappear, then they, they will switch. We also see females who specialize on large prey that are in deeper water. When they have pups, when their pups are small, they actually switch to smaller prey that occur in kelp beds. So we actually see them relax their specialization when they have a pup. Um, and they'll, they'll start eating a lot more mussels and smaller things that they get in kelp forests. As their pups get bigger, then they start to slowly move into deeper water. And then eventually, once their pups are weaned, the females go back to specializing on what they were specializing on before. So, you, so you're right. I mean, if you, are, uh, if you are a specialist, it does behoove you to keep an eye on what everything else is doing. Um, and and maybe, it may even be that they need to practice just enough so that they sort of have an, an insurance policy if their preferred prey disappears. So that's a great question. Thank you. Another diet question. You mentioned that San Nicolas Island isn't very big, so when they start running out of their preferred food in the areas they're used to hunting in, do they move or do they stay where they are and change diet? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we think, um, well, what I would predict, and we haven't seen it yet, what I predict is both. Um, we actually have seen some increase, not, nothing like the diverse diet we see in the mainland yet, and that's because there's still a ton of urchins out there. One of the things about San Nicolas is there was really abundant two species of urchins, so they, they actually did deplete all the red urchins, not all of them, but the, the red urchin abundance, you, we've really seen a, a decrease in abundance from otter predation, particularly at the west end of the island, and only now are they now beginning to consume the purple urchins. So that's why I think they, it, they, they didn't control urchins completely at first, it was the, those two different species. As the purple urchins um, get low, we are starting to see them eat more um, large lithopoma snails and, a few, and also some more kelp crabs. So they're beginning to diversify their diet, but um, we're, we totally expect them to start to spread around the island. They just really haven't done it yet. Um, we actually expected that a few years ago. And then, of course, they're going to spread to other islands. And we already, in fact, we're um, sending one of my biologists out next week to have a look at Santa Rosa, where we have reports of two uh, probably male otters out there. Um, there's a couple at San Miguel that go periodically. So it, we're just right at the edge of them beginning to colonize some of the other Channel Islands, um, which will be very exciting. Yeah? Yeah, with the diet specialization, uh, do you see uh, like different species of different diseases and also lifespan and also physical mm -hmm. uh, differences among different species because of the diet specialization? Yes. Yeah, so Tim, the, Tim the, can you the, repeat? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat the question, yes. So, so the, question, the question was, um, with these different diet specializations, do, do they translate into different health differences, different disease um, prevalences, different um, morphological characteristics or survival or reproduction? Um, which, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, we, uh, I already mentioned the, the differences in disease prevalence. We've seen that with a couple of different things, the protozoan parasites. Um, we're starting to see that in some of the uh, some other disease types as well, and also in terms of um, demoic acid um, exposure, which they get from um, you know the, the diatom pseudonychia that produces this toxin when it has big blooms. 
Um, it looks like different diet different types of diet specialists have different risks of exposure to that based on what they're consuming. So definitely they have different health risks. Um, in terms of reproductive success, we actually, we've now got reproductive histories for about 400 female animals and about, I think it's about 1,000, over 1,000 different pups. Um, so we're beginning to analyze that to look at exactly that question. And what we're seeing um, in general is no, there's no significant differences in reproductive success between different diet specialist types. Um, within each specialist type, you have both winners and losers, basically. Um, so that, again, sort of suggests that there is some sort of frequency dependence uh, in the relative abundance of the different prey specialists. If everybody was trying to be a snail specialist or everyone was trying to be an abalone specialist at that point, it, they would deplete those prey and they wouldn't be as profitable. But when you have sort of this balance between the relative um, numbers of specialist types, then they all tend to do just about as well. Please go to the microphone if you do have a question. No more questions? I'm happy to stick around and, uh, and talk to people or answer some questions. Is there the anybody who would like me to bring the microphone to them <laughs> because I couldn't get to them? I wondered, you mentioned that you only had 12 adults stay at, that, uh, at the island, and that, that's a real small founder population. I wonder if you saw any signs, that it's grown very well, but I wonder if there were any potential problems that you began to see from the small founder population. Yeah, yeah, I know that is, that is a very small population. And in fact, uh, probably that's comparable to almost all the founder populations um, post, post fur trade. Um, so the, in terms of having, um, losing genetic diversity, um, there's two things you need for that to happen. One is to reduce to very small size, but the other is it for it to remain at that small size long enough for, genet for to lose alleles and genetic diversity by, by drift. Um, and it, in that case, it, it seems that there was probably not low long enough. When we compare the diversity, at least across all the microsatellite sites that we have, we see the same level of diversity at, um, at San Nicolas as on the mainland range. That said, the mainland range itself is a pretty low level of diversity as well. So it doesn't look like they, over that period of time, they, they lost too much in the way of diversity. Um, but yeah, it is certainly something that we're concerned about. And, and also in the mainland range, we, we recognize that there's pretty low genetic diversity um, throughout California and, and in other Seattle populations to the north as well, actually. How does a little sea otter pry up a great big abalone? It takes divers a pry, pry bar to get them up. How do they do it? <laughs> That's a great question. So I'll start by saying sea otters are really freakishly strong. Um, they have short little stubby forearms, but their muscles are just huge. And so even a small, you don't want to challenge a sea otter to an arm wrestling contest. Um, <laughs> They also have uh, semi-retractable claws like a cat. So when we're handling them, um, they, their claws are generally retract that part and their paws are incredibly soft. Um, but when they want to, they can exert those claws. So basically, when they're prying up abalone, um, claws come out and they just have this incredible strength. But they have another thing in addition to all of that. And those, in many cases, that's enough for them to pry off an abalone that you or I would not have a hope of prying off. They can use tools. Um, and that's, uh, I didn't mention that tonight, but that's another um, series of studies we've done in the foraging ecology is uh, differences in tool use. And it turns out that for the otters that we see using tools at the surface, about almost all of them are snail specialists. So when you see an otter with a rock, or if you're out in Monterey at early in the morning, it's foggy and you hear this kind of quack, 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 quack. That's a tool using sea otter, but you, there's about a 95% chance that it's, that's a snail specialist that's using that tool. Snail specialists use tools about 98% of the time on, uh, on their dives, and other specialists use it very little. It depends what they're specializing on. The next most frequent are mussel and clam specialists. Urchin specialists use tools almost 0% of the time. Um, so that, that tool use, um, it allows, gives them, in, increases their efficiency with certain prey. The one prey that it's really hard to tell are abalone specialists. We don't, they don't use tools at the surface, but we do sometimes, when they start making dives in one location and we know they're gonna come up with an abalone, it takes them about 20 dives, especially for like a really big red abalone, like a dinner plate size abalone. Um, when we're watching one of our specialists, they're going along the coast, dive, 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 and then we start to see them, start to see them make dives in one location. 
And when they come up, they're not getting anything. They're out of breath. They're literally, they come up to the surface and they're like, <sighs> and they're rubbing their arms. And sometimes they're carrying a rock and then they go down. So we can't say for sure, but we're pretty darn certain that in some times they're using, the abalone specialists are, are hidden tool users. They're using tools at the bottom to pry up the abalone. But they, when they, they drop, when they finally do get the abalone, they drop the rock, they bring up the abalone, and then they're just eating it like a dinner plate. They're just, you know, scooping it out. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, yeah, that's, the, the tools are their hidden, their hidden weapon. Yeah. You mentioned um, that the whiskers have uh, a history of what they ate or their diet. Mm -hmm. uh, does it give you an average of the last one and a half years or is it more of granular, you know, stages of what they ate? It's sequential. It's just like fingernails. It's only, it's only growing at the cuticle. So once it grows out, it's inert. So the tips of the whisker is a, it tells us about the stable isotope concentrations um, a year and a half ago. And then right at the follicle, um, that tells us about what they ate very recently. So we chop it into, um, just by convention, 20 different samples. And for each, every one of our, and we tend to take the longest whiskers as well because we want to get the longest samples. So we um, analyze that with those 20 different samples. And that's how we measure specialization actually. It's, it's comparison of within individual variants in, in isotopic niche width compared to between individual variants. Yeah. Oh. Back to eating. <laughs> how does a sea otter eat an urchin? So I mentioned they don't use tools. You might think they might. So urchins have these great spines, right? Their protection, but their their actual tests, their their shells are incredibly thin and brittle. Anybody, if it wasn't for those spines, anybody can crack an urchin's test. It's like unlike a turban snail. They need to use tools there because the turban snail has one of the most, you cannot, you, try as you might, if you had a turban snail, you could not crush it between your fingers. Or if you were, you're really, really strong. Mm -hmm. Otters can't either. Um, and if they tried to bite it, they would probably crack their dentine, but that's why they use rocks. Urchins, on the other hand, easy to break, but they're protected by these spines. What, um, what they do is they roll them between their paws. Mm -hmm. So, and, and even with the big ones, um, they bring them up, they just, if, it, if it's a red urchin with huge spines, they sort of flatten it down with one paw. But for most of the smaller ones they're eating, they just bring them up, they, they have their little armpit pouches. So they can carry about 20 urchins um, or so in a dive. They'll come up, just reach in the pit, crack it in the side, suck out all the insides, drop it, grab the next one, like that. So they can, they can process them really fast. So if, that's how you process an urchin. Yeah. Um, why do they have such a high metabolism? Is that because of a loss of heat? Yes, yes. In, in short, so they're the, um, they're the marine mammal that shouldn't be. Um, they're, they're, you know, as compared to other marine mammals, they, they're relatively recently evolved back to marine existence, although they've still been, they've had, you know, had quite a bit of time in the ocean. But unlike all the other mammals um, that went back to the ocean that developed thick blubber layers being their primary insulation, mm -hmm. sea otters did not. They have no subcutaneous fat almost whatsoever. Mm -hmm. They're reliant on the thickest fur of any mammal, mm -hmm. thus the fur trade. Mm -hmm. um, it's very luxuriant fur, but they have to, it's a very expensive type of insulation because you have to groom about you know, 10 times a day or so to keep it in that perfectly waterproof state. And then the other thing they do is they have about three and a half times the metabolic rate of a terrestrial carnivore of the same size, and they maintain that by eating a ton. Mm -hmm. um, so between that thick fur and that really high metabolic rate, they are able to maintain about the same level of sort of thermoregulation as a harbor seal. Um, but as I say, it's a very expensive way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. What are the natural? What are the natural enemies that keep the population under control? So. As a, that's a very interesting question. So apex predators, by virtue of being an apex predator, don't have natural enemies and they keep themselves under control or more specifically, they're limited by something else. They're generally limited by a limiting resource. For some predators, that may be space or maybe something else, but for a lot of top predators, the limiting resource are their prey populations. So they reach an equilibrium with their prey populations. And that's, so those dynamics I was mentioning, as they deplete their most preferred prey, they start to diversify in less and less prof profitable prey. That, over the, what that means is they're eating less and less profitable prey, any one animal. Their, their consumption goes down, their body condition goes down, their survival rates go down, and eventually their survival and their births equal and they're at carrying capacity. So they're limited mostly, mostly 
from below, basically, to a bottom-up limitation. Um, there are instances where sea otters are, um, where they are suddenly not the apex predator. One of those happened in the Aleutian Islands when another predator started to consume them, the killer whales. And at that point, and that changes everything, right? Now their equilibrium is not being set by their prey, it's being set by the amount of refuge habitat they have from killer whales. So when you go to the Aleutians now, there are these little, we call them otter hot spots. They're generally in either completely lagoons that you just can't get into, or they're in these um, reefy areas where the otters will rest over top of reefs that are only just about you know a meter or so below them, um, and then they'll feed just a couple meters away from where they're resting. So they're just they've learned not to go very far away from these um, sort of secure areas. Um, so that's that's in the Aleutians. Down here, there's areas where they're not being limited by their prey; they're being limited by shark bite mortality, um, particularly down around uh, well the south end of the range around Point Conception, and then the north end of the range around Half Moon Bay down to Año Nuevo. In those areas, sharks aren't eating otters, um, they're biting them, they eat other things, but they, they go up and they do these um, investigatory bites, um, and they do it not just with a few otters, but well, hundreds, hundreds a year. Um, we've got now thousands of shark bit carcasses, so um, in those two areas I just mentioned, the north and south end of the range, shark bite right now is the primary source of mortality, and it's what's keeping the population from spreading to the north or south now. So that's, it's not really predation, but it's kind of a, a special type of, um, of predator limitation. I read recently, but I can't remember where, that on some instances the orcas are coming in closer to the shore and actually capturing sea otters. Is that true? And if so, to what extent? Not that we know of here in California. Um, there have been a couple, well, so, so first off, again, backing up. In the Aleutians, yes, that's sort of what, that's what we saw in the early 90s. Um, they, before then, they hadn't really been coming in. Well, they'd been along the edge of the kelp beds eating sea lions and harbor seals. Um, but what we saw, the change in behavior we saw then in the early 90s and that, you know, right through the 90s and into the early 2000s was they began to come right into the kelp beds and eat sea otters right in front of our eyes. I mean, one of the times I w we were watching it literally from a cliff top, one of our tagged otters, and we were watching the killer whales come along the coast, but the otters couldn't see them because they were sort of in this little cove. And we, all three of us, were just sort of watching this little vignette, this vignette happening right below us. And the killer whale came up right in the kelp bed, right in the middle of the group of sea otters. So they figured out this new hunting technique pretty, pretty quickly, and it had a huge effect. We haven't seen that outside of southwest Alaska, except periodically in Glacier Bay. Um, there are, there's quite a few killer whales that come in there and, and feed on other marine mammals. Um, primarily harbor seals, but periodically they have been seen going into otter groups and, and taking sea otters. Um, it doesn't seem to have be frequent enough there to limit the abundance of sea otters, but it, it definitely shows that they are capable of doing that. So um, it's something we're always kind of watching out for. Going once, going twice. People are getting tired. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thank you very much. And I hope to safe and happy holidays to all, and I hope to see you January 25th for Doug Gibbons' talk on Shake Alert.